You're listening to the Radical Departures podcast, your source for startup storytelling. I'm your host, Abby Klein. On the show, I interview entrepreneurs and other professionals from throughout the French and greater European startup ecosystems. We look at some of the interesting new developments that have taken place in France over the last few years and how the country is developing into a startup nation. On Radical Departures, you'll hear founders of some of the hottest companies share their stories and important things they've learned along the way. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. This is episode 39 of the Radical Departures podcast. My guest today is Sylvain Tillon, co-founder and CEO of Tilki a software that allows you to track what recipients do with the documents you send them. Sylvain has founded three companies, co-written three books, and is passionate about entrepreneurship, including normalizing failure and increasing transparency. He incorporates those subjects into his management and expansion of Tilki, which recently raised another major round of funding. In this episode, we talk about his previous ventures, what he's working on building at Tilki, the slowly changing attitudes around failure in France, and much more. So without further ado, here's episode 39 with Sylvain Tillon. My guest today is Sylvain Tillon, co-founder and CEO of Tilki. Welcome, Sylvain. Welcome, Abby. Tell us just very briefly, what is Tilki? Tilki is software that put trackers into documents so we can know who read the document, which page, how long on each page, in which order, and even what part of the document was the most interesting. So it's a computer of docs and or clear slide in Europe and legal for European companies. So what need did you see that you wanted to fill by creating Tilki? I just created Tilki for myself at the beginning because I was a bad salesman, I think. But I, I loved hearing my customer or prospect during two hours saying what he needs. At the end, when I, I, I thought I, I had the idea or the solution for him, he told me, okay, Simon, please write a business proposal and send it to me. I will show it to my associate partner or colleague. I was doing this at and just waiting for an answer. And I could wait a long time. In France, you don't say yes or no. You never answer for a business proposal. So you have to follow up every day. It's boring. I hate taking my phone to follow up my prospects. So I created just for me because I was lazy. And it worked so well that I decided to propose it to my friends and to other companies. And do you ever get any pushback on that? Like people not wanting you to be able to see what it is that they're doing or not doing reading your document? They don't know that they are tracked mm -hmm. when they open the document. And they don't have to know that they are tracked. And at the end, they like to be followed up at the right time. So they prefer that I call them just once at a good moment than every day. So Tilki is not your first company. It is my third year. So tell us a little bit about your background. I created my first company when I was 20 because I was doing motorbike and I had an idea of air jewels. So I know there is no sense between those, but on my jacket, sometimes my air was stuck in it. And I thought it could be a good idea to put some jewels like this in my hair. To keep your hair back? Yeah. Okay. But it was not nice at all. <laughs> But I loved that idea. And in my business school, they told me, you could do something about it. It could be a great idea. So work on it and find something else. I just saw my mother sewing my pants, because I don't know why. And she used the tool to put the thread into the shoe very easily. And I said, oh, could we do the same thing to put some jewels in the air? I patented this idea in 2003, and I started my company like this. I was 20, crazy. I was not seeing colors. I was not going to the hairdresser either. Meaning you were colorblind? Yeah. Okay, interesting. I don't go to the address. I don't know that kind of companies. But I thought it could be a nice idea to start my life as an entrepreneur. And it was much more harder than I could imagine. First, it was to find a company that could build my product. I went to all French companies and this, they all told me, yeah, you are too young and it, it will never work. So please, don't bother us. 
And the only company that said, okay, I can try is a Chinese company. They can copy anything. It's great. I just sent them my prototype and they did a copy of it. It was quite cheap, quite nice. And I started in 2004 like this. But every time I received new jewels from them, there was a new mistake on it. And I had to put new rules to check every time. It was quite hard. I didn't even know which component they used to build my products. I was working with Varovsky. It was a nice and renowned company in Europe. But my jewels were not, didn't have the good quality for my customers. Worst adventure with a Chinese industry was in 2005. I was going to China to check if everything was okay. And all my products were, there was some dust on them. Because they glued uh, the jewels table where there was some dust everywhere. So there were some glue under the product. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. But some glue and dust on the product. When I told that to the director of the company, she told me, Sylvain, just put a tissue on it and it's okay. No, there was 100,000 jewels I should clean. And she told me, oh, your customers can do it. No, they won't. Buy your product, it's 20 euros, and clean it before they can put it in the air. Of course. So do it now, or I don't take them. And we tried, it didn't work. But I knew she can do something else to clean it. And we did it together, and I said, okay, do it for all of them, and I will come back in three days, and I will see if it's okay. And something great there that they can work with everyone. So all the uncles, cousins, friends of the village came and they cleaned the product, but they did it the bad way. And when I came back to France, there was no glue anymore on the product, and I couldn't sell them. It was quite a hard moment for me and my colleagues because it was working in Europe. And we found a new idea on something to sell. And then in 2006, French companies said, OK, you've, you sold 500,000 pieces in Europe, so now we could be interested and changed my life, but it was too late, I think. And one year later, I went to bankruptcy with suits by my banks. Worst moment of my life. Even my girlfriend, uh, she left me because I was not an entrepreneur anymore. I had no hope. And when I was waking up in the morning, I, I didn't know what I should do. So I went to find some job and something great. When you fail your company, even in France, you will find jobs. Companies like entrepreneurs. They're quite afraid of the entrepreneurs, yeah. but they like this kind of ambition and way of working. But I couldn't work in a big company. I was my own chief since I was 20. I had four colleagues, four employees. And I created a new company in 2008 about just what I loved and what I was doing every day, teaching and writing comics. Hmm. So That's what all. kind of company can you create a, around that? Just mine. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it, I had no business plan. I just wrote two pages on how much I need every day to live. Then what should I do to earn that money? Hmm. That's all. And then we'll see where it goes. And it went well. Now it's a company with 16 employees and doing 1.5 million euros turnover. So. Quite a nice company. And was it acquired then? Or? No, no, it's still mine. Okay. But I'm not allowed to work there anymore <laughs> by my investors of Tilki because they told okay. me if you want some, our money, stop working for Sido, the second company, and work completely for Tilki. And they were quite right because after two years of Tilki, it was so hard. Everyone loved Tilki, but no one was paying for mm. Tilki. It's so a like, challenge of software yeah. often, huh? A lot of notoriety and a lot of communication about it. And people said, oh, it's such a good idea. You will be the best. It will be success. But no, they don't pay. And if I had the choice to come back to Sido, maybe I would have taken it. But I knew I couldn't go there. So I continued. And one day, the CEO of ADECO, a recruitment company in Europe, said we will take Tilki for all our salespeople. The week after this, EDF said, okay, we will try. And then it started. But I don't know why, maybe just time. I couldn't do it again, but hopefully I stayed. <laughs> and now it's very nice. 
So you recently raised three and a half million euros. Is yeah. that right? And one of the things that you've done is to be quite transparent about that. So you've published the slide deck that you used, the pitch deck that you used, right? Exactly. Yeah, we don't do it in Europe. I found some pitch deck in the US, but it's not the same market or the same way of working in Europe. So I couldn't copy everything. And I couldn't use the same figures for my investors. So for me, it was quite important to share what we found and what we wrote. It's, you won't find any secret in it. Uh, you know, we have already competitors, they use other technologies, and you can do it if you want. But what's unique in our company, I think it's our employees and our team, so you can't copy that. And in 20 slides, you won't find any secrets. And you're also transparent internally. Is that right? You talk about salaries and who makes how much, and it's not private. Nothing is private. So um, what's the thought process behind that? I want my colleagues think it is their own company. And I found it on Buffer Company in the U.S., they publish their wages or the way they pay people. And we did the same because I don't like when there are differences that I couldn't explain. I need to, to explain why this web developer is maybe more pain than, than you because you are just an assistant of communication in my company. And you have to understand it and to know even my salary is known inside the company. So you can have beers with your colleagues without thinking maybe it's more pain than me because he has a greater diploma or is older or maybe just he knew the boss before he gets hired. So I don't want this kind of thoughts in, inside my company. And so easy to manage people when they know because they can choose at the beginning, yeah, I want to work in that kind of company or no, I don't like this. They know what they're getting into. Yeah. What were some mistakes, looking back, what you would call mistakes at the beginning of Tilki? Holidays. I didn't take any holidays during two years because when you create your company, you don't have to take holidays. But you have to. <laughs> in France, in August, there is nothing to do. Don't stay in the office. Just take a break. Even if work is hard, take a break. And sometimes you will find solutions to do it faster. But I was young and people told me, Sylvain, you started your company. You cannot have holidays. It's not a good time for you. Worst advice ever. Another one it would be don't follow up your invoices and don't ask for money. Because I thought when I was billing a customer, he would pay me a day. No, in France, you don't pay people. You have to wait to be paid or you have to follow up like 12 times. It's frustrating. Frustrating and I can't understand that kind of thinking, but you have to follow up. If you don't follow up, they won't never pay you and you can crash your company which is good and in good health just because you are not paid. Billing was good, just money didn't come in your company. So being ruthless about getting after people who owe you money. Yeah, now, now I'm even tracking my bills. And if they don't open it before the date, they should pay me. I send something more legal to be sure that they received it before mm. the day they should pay me. So they cannot say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't receive it. Could you send it? to me again and again and again, and we lost it all. We are so sorry. Mm -hmm. So to get back to failure a little bit, a few questions about it, but what role has failure played in your life as an entrepreneur? Because you had failure at the beginning, okay? Now it sounds like you've had more success since then, but it's something that you've focused on a fair amount. You've co-written a couple of books that talk a lot about failure. Talking was my therapy about failing because I was a good student. I did one of the best business schools in France. I had never failed anything, maybe except my motorbike license the first time. And it taught me to be humble, to know that things are not due to you and you have to get them. Sometimes it just doesn't work. And it is your fault, no one else's fault, not your investor's fault, not your employee's fault, it is your fault when it fails. And it is so easy to fail, you know. And sometimes I, I did a bad failure, okay. But sometimes you work like 100 hours every week. You don't see your family anymore. You have no friends anymore. And you just, you are paid like 1,000 euros a month. And for me, it's like a failure too. Because you have no life and you, are, you have no wage. And sometimes you should accept you are in a failure 
state and you should stop. Influence courts can be nice if you come before you don't have any money on your bank account. But to accept it, you have to accept that you are failing. And it is impossible to accept it when you create your company, but you should. And you should say, I can stop it and I can do it again, maybe later, but differently. And it's important to share this. You can fail, even in France, and you will start better and, or you will find a good job. But stop being in your own prison. Did you feel that you weren't prepared? You said you went to one of the best business schools. You, you, know, you never really failed at anything. You weren't prepared for that, for what that felt like. Even to create my company, I was not prepared. I remember my entrepreneurship financial course. On the first exercise, company was doing more than 5 million turnover the first year. Which company <laughs> does what, more than 5 million turnover the first year? It doesn't not realistic, exist. no. So, no, I, I wasn't even prepared to create and not at all to fail. We don't speak about it in, in business school. But it could be a nice course. It, it's a good idea. I should propose it to you my... teach it? Uh, <laughs> business school, yeah. How do you see the French relationship to failure overall? You say in business school you weren't prepared for it, but in France today, do you think that it's changing this fear of failure or that it's perpetuated as a, you know, it's kind of a stigma. And if you failed once as an entrepreneur, you won't be trusted by VCs or is that changing? Laws and government change about it. Ten years ago, I was marked as 040 at Banque de France and I couldn't get any loans or even open a bank account because when you fail, you are criminal in France. You were. And now it's much better in the laws. Uh, but not really in the society. Even parents or your family is not, can't understand what it is when you fail. And there is no one to help you. A great association, 60,000 uh, 60, uh, rebonds, is nice because it is former entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who already had failures that are going to help you. And failure shouldn't be seen as a success. Like a badge of honor. Yeah. We try to copy Americans. I, I love American way of thinking, but we try to copy that, but in the bad way. I remember that company, I'm sorry for them, but take it easy. The two entrepreneurs said first in the media that they were failing before telling their employees. And they said, oh, our investors were not nice with us because they told us they would give us money and they didn't. So we are failing. We are Sorry, it's not our fault. It's your fault. And tell your employees first. Don't say it to the media and accept it. So we don't, shouldn't push the heads of the entrepreneurs under the water. And we shouldn't give them a badge of honor because they failed. We should find our own way of accepting failure. So on a, a more positive note, what's next for Tilki? What, what do you have envisioned for the future now that you've raised this latest round? We are going to set up in London soon, in September normally, and we are going to acquire a company in Germany soon too, because we are speaking with two companies there. And my idea is to create a transparent company and to show that it can work. A company without hierarchy, and everyone knows everything, or he can know everything if he wants. And I would like to create a new kind of company and to show my investors and other companies it can work. Do you have any examples of that that you look to as a model? Swatch, Swiss company that did it until 100 employees. It just becomes harder to manage, I guess. I think so, yeah. Sylvain, I appreciate you taking the time to join me. I have one last question before you go. How do you personally define success? When you are smiling every morning when you are going to your job, it's the best success. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. That wraps up another episode of Radical Departures. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave us a review and let us know who you'd like to hear on the show. Catch you next week.